Okay, Dr. Mindy here, and I'm coming to you guys for my normal Thursday Q&A. And if you are not aware of it, today or this week has been fast training week for our community. So if you're in the process of fasting with us this week, just let us know, put it in the notes, uh, put it in the comments. Uh, we always love to know who's with us, how your experience has been. Uh, I think it's probably one of the greatest things we do once a month is that we just have this worldwide community and we all come together and we all practice fasting and it's such an incredible way to connect uh, with people all over the world. So we love knowing where you're from. We love knowing how your fasting experience is going. So I'm going to answer some of your questions today. So if you have questions regarding fasting. Uh, and your specifically your fast training experience, that'd be awesome. I'd love to, to take those questions. Um, I wanna point out a couple of things. Uh, I put out to, uh, a series of videos. So I just got done doing a three-part series on the thyroid. And it's, uh, if you have any thyroid issues, please go watch all three together. So those are in a playlist here on YouTube. Um, so know that those are there for you. And one of the most interesting things that came out of my research for those videos was that there is evidence showing that the liver, in order to convert T4 into T3, needs to have a certain level of insulin. Now, this is a dilemma for those of us that love to fast because we don't want our insulin to go down too low for too long of a period or we can start to throw our hormones off. And we've seen this, those of you who've read the menopause reset and you're working on your progesterone levels and estrogen levels have experienced this, that too much fasting can start to tank your hormones. So if that is a new concept for you, please go look at that video that I did on fasting and the thyroid because it, and dive into that. We always link the science in there. So dive into those into the science and make sure that you're clear on it. And this is why we call it a fasting lifestyle. This, as you learn these principles, we want you to try all different kinds of fasting. But what a lot of people experience is that you guys get to this point where you are in love with how your results and you don't ever want to come out of those results. So you don't, you just keep fasting, you keep doing one meal a day, and that is a recipe for a breakdown in the body. You are not meant to fast all the time. You're meant to go from feast, famine, cycling. So let's go back to the cave person day. Remember, there were times when they had a ton, ton of food, they made a big kill, they would eat for days where they would just eat, eat, eat. And then there were winters, months, where they wouldn't have any food. So in the, and they had obviously no refrigeration. So the human design has not changed since the cave person day. Like some days that like blows my mind if you stop and you think about it. Like we are literally living in the same body that cave people lived in. Yet in this modern world, it, we couldn't be any more different in, in what the, the environment in which the body is living in. So we get in these dilemmas in the modern world that our design was made for years ago, yet we have access to food all the time. And now we've got all these electronics on us and we've got the stress of the day and now we've got a virus we've got to think about. And so the whole name of the game is to come back to this design. And let's just, we can learn so much by like coming back to how we were designed. And we are not designed to fast all the time, yet fasting is miraculous. So we want to know how to cycle it. And that's what I'm trying to teach you guys here. This is what we are diving in very deep in our Reset Academy with and helping people understand. So if you want deeper understanding, join our academy and, and you, you'll see there's a lot more discussion and communication on that topic. So that's the first thing I would say. Second thing, I have a video coming out tomorrow on immune strategies. So I just want, one of the things that's gonna happen to all of us right now is that we're gonna, we're getting more, and it may be already happening in your area, that more and more people are coming out of the shelter in place in the quarantine time. So there are some really smart things you can do. And again, if I go back to research, there are really four things that we all should be doing and fasting in different styles of fasting is one of them. 
So tomorrow I'm gonna address the other three things. So stay tuned for that video. Again, I bring you the science. And, and what I did with this series is I wanted to make it like, so that anybody could do these four things, that you didn't have to have money to do these four things. Like you didn't have to have time. Like these four things are just common sense things that we should be doing so that we can keep our immune system at its best. And again, on that topic, I will just say that that social distancing is not immune building. So we, there are two sides of this conversation and I wanna make sure you guys are getting the information, you're seeing the science on the really smart things we can do to keep our immune system strong. Okay, and then the last thing, well, actually I'll do two more things. Um, a lot of people are asking for like recipes and food. And um, I know if you're fasting, it seems counter counterintuitive, but we did a lot of autophagy fasting, which is involve eating. Um, I interviewed this woman, Anna Vicino, on my podcast. If you haven't seen the Resetter podcast, go check it out. Um, it, we've got, I just did a, a, a interview with Al Alyssa Goodman about her, what her experience of, of getting cancer and her husband getting cancer. It's, tr it's an incredible conversation. So please go listen to that one this week. And Anna's interview comes out next week. Um, we made some recipes from this over the weekend that were amazing. And you can either order this off Amazon, you can go to her website um, or, uh, and on her website, she has free recipes. So, and they're all gluten-free, grain-free, low-carb recipes for a joyful life. Um, and her podcast will come out next week and she's hysterical. Oh my God, so funny. She's actually a comedian. So we had such a great time um, on, that, on that interview. Now, let's talk about autophagy before I open it up for questions. I want you to remember that there's this seesaw of autophagy and mTOR. So autophagy is cleaning the cells and the cleaning up of those cells is what we've been doing this week. You stimulate autophagy by going into at least 17 hours of fasting or more and keeping your protein under 20 grams. So if during this week you did all autophagy fasting this whole week, you most likely kept yourself in a state of autophagy the whole week. That's awesome. And if you did water fast, for sure you did. Fabulous, you've cleaned up the cells, the cells are repairing. If you had any adverse effects of that, like um, skin rashes, or you gained weight, or you had brain fog, or anything that made you feel worse as the week goes on, then th that's a sign that something called apoptosis happened. When the cells look around and they have to be cleaned up, what often happens is they say, the intelligence says, okay, the cell has to die now, I'm gonna kill it, and as it kills it, the, the chemicals, the toxins that are inside of it will get redistributed into other areas. Pathogens can get redistributed. So it's important that if you had adverse effects that instead of blaming the fast to look at it and go, whoa, I may be a little more toxic than I realized. So know that that's all that is. Okay, on the other side of that is mTOR. And this is what I wanna encourage you to go into after this fast. mTOR is where we're building up muscle, we're, we're creating growth. So mTOR gets stimulated with protein load. So you just went through this experience where you have really got yourself into low protein. What would really be awesome as you move into the weekend would be to stimulate mTOR for a couple of days. And the best way to stimulate mTOR for your benefit is to do 20 grams of protein every couple of hours. So don't sit down and necessarily have like a huge steak and do 150 grams of protein all at once. Your mTOR um, efforts are best there, it's best for you to basically do small 20 grams every couple of hours. So an egg, couple of eggs, you can do some collagen uh, protein, you can do, uh, you know, a little bit of steak, but all like periodically, like giving yourselves these little protein boosts throughout the day will stimulate mTOR. How you build muscle as you move through this, this um, experience of building a fasting lifestyle is you stimulate autophagy. And, and I always say you should do about 70, 80% of your time should be 
stimulating autophagy, and then the other 20, 30 should be stimulating mTOR. And that's how you're gonna build muscle, you're gonna slow down the aging process, you're gonna get all the benefits of fasting, but you're not going to lose, you're not gonna waste away, you're not gonna lose muscle, you're not gonna end up with all the hair loss, the things we see when people do too much fasting. So know that that's, that's kind of where I stand on what you do when you come out of this, is let's go in, go watch those videos on protein loading and protein cycling, because the now would be the time, or let's see, today's Thursday, Friday, Saturday would be the moment to do that. Like this weekend, do some protein loading. So with that, I will open it up for questions. And um, also we love, we love knowing where you guys are from. I know we got people all over. All over. We really got people all over the world today. Awesome. Um, so definitely, we have, um, yeah, um, Barbados, Ohio, Finland, Utah. Awesome. Italy, England, Israel. Awesome. All over the world. Awesome. So I love it. We are Saudi Arabia. Yeah. We had. I'll tell you a story before he, he Sequoia tells me the question. We've had a really had a really cool experience when we started doing all this fast training that we actually had. A, um, a, a man in Australia who was leading an Aborigines tribe through uh, the concepts of fasting. And so he was sharing my videos and it was to a group of women who were, pro their community was prone to diabetes. This happens a lot with native, uh, native indigenous people. They're just like, they're not taught the proper, like they're eating the crappy food. Anyways, they ended up like losing a ton of weight and do, and um, really turning their health around. And it was so cool because here I am in California and the information got to this uh, Aboriginal tribe in Australia. And we love our world community. So um, let's see, we are getting, Debbie's in there answering a lot of questions. Okay, So awesome. Uh, thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Debbie. Um, a lot of people are confused. Are you saying don't fast? So people are like, what about my OMAD? So because of the thyroid, they're confused on the thyroid. And so maybe just okay. Yeah. So go make sure you watch that video. So you don't. If you're doing OMAD every single day, that is what I'm encouraging you to step out of. So what does it look like to step out of that? In the most basic sense, I am a fan of what I call a five-one-one variation. So five days a week, you, and let's just use it with fasting. Five days a week, you're doing like 18 hours of fasting. So I know a lot of you guys like to do 18-6. Awesome, so five days a week, you can, you can do that. One day a week, you can go longer. You can go 24 hours. I'm a huge fan of the 24-hour fast. And then one day a week, you've got to feast. So you've got to stop fasting. And if you don't want to like, you know, feast on carby foods, do a protein load day but you gotta step out of that OMAD at least one day a week. And because you don't want your thyroid numbers to go off. Now, there's a couple ways you could approach this. You could say, well, I don't, I don't really have a thyroid problem. I don't, I'm not worried about my thyroid. I love my OMAD. And you could, just, you could just stay doing that. And hopefully you're getting blood work every year and you wanna specifically look at your T3 levels because what happens is the thyroid will end up producing T4. T4 goes to the liver and gut and converts it into T3 and T3 goes into the cell. So if you're not making that conversion from T4 to T3, then we've got a liver or gut issue. And it's the, the it, they actually, the study was a starvation state and it was done over a longer period of time. So as long as you're throwing in some, some days here and there, one day a week is totally fine where you pull yourself out of OMAD. That would be great. And you're actually purposely trying to raise your insulin and then you go back into it the next day. So that still gives you six days a week where you can keep your insulin low, but you're not putting yourself into that starv starvation state week after week after week and the liver can still do its job. Let me know if that makes sense. So it's the variation that's key. Um, still a lot of people from other parts of the world, literally worldwide. Awesome. So. Um, some people, Alyssa is just uh, talking about she's, whenever she gets stressed, it's very hard for her to Oh stress. yeah, thank you. I'm glad we're gonna address this. So Alyssa said whenever she gets stressed, it gets really hard for her to fast. Um, yes, so it's interesting because there's one, um, one 
moment in time that I really encourage people to not to try to go into long fast and that's when your stress is the highest. I think that you can do intermittent fasting most of the time and you'll be fine. So it doesn't matter if stress is high or low, intermittent fasting should be pretty good for you. But when stress goes up and it's really high, um, I do not recommend longer than like a 17 hour fast. And, and if it feels natural and you're having a day where you're like, okay, I can do this, no problem. But if you feel like you're efforting, it's not good. So remember that fasting raises cortisol. It's a little bit, so it's a little, this is again why we like to do the in and outs a lot. So if your cortisol is already high, you're already under a lot of stress, and then you decide, hey, it's fast training week, I'm gonna try to go into a five day water fast, not a great idea, not a great idea. Um, we see this in our Reset Academy too when we've got people who are really avid exercisers and they're like doing incredible things in, with their fitness, um, but they push their body so much. Well, exercise will raise your cortisol as well. So if you're raising your cortisol through, through the stress of life, through exercise, and now you throw a fast in, it may be difficult. So you're gonna have to be patient with yourself and, and know how to time which fast when. Um, and it really is about you know driving your own health and figuring out what is right for you, which is why we lay out seven fasts here. I do this all the time for myself. I'm, yesterday, I, did a tw I was doing 24 hours. Today, it was like 15 hours in, 14 hours in, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to, to break my fast. So I had a really long day yesterday, so I know that, and stress was up. So I'm like, okay, today I'm gonna do a little less fasting. So you get to play with those pieces as you go through this experience. Just listen to your body. I think, and it's, it's hard, I, I, I get that it's hard because it's easier for me to stand up here and do, say, do this, do exactly this. But we're dynamic bodies. I mean, we're, we're, our body's always changing and morphing according to what is in our environment. And so when the stress goes up in our environment, then we have to be more in tune with pulling out a different tool to handle that stress. So that, that's a great question. Let me know if that helps. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's see, just more questions about what you were just talking about. About stress? No, about fasting, maybe. And the uh, thyroid? Just fasting and time and okay. why it's not good. So a lot of people are surprised. Um, Wait, just so I know, you guys are surprised that you shouldn't fast all the time? You're surprised that you should be varying it? That's kind of, just so I know how to answer you guys. And if you, le here's the other thing is if you leave your comments in there, we'll go back and look at them and then this is how I make videos out of them. Uh, out of what you're where where you're getting stuck i'll make some new videos for you we see so. a lot of themes then we'll know yeah what like thyroid people. we had a lot of people asking like thought i mean totally off tangent but one of the things people ask us a lot is what about medication when you're fasting well i found a study that you you have a higher absorption rate of your thyroid meds when you're in a fasted state so you may react to your medications differently which is why you should probably involve your doctor in that process so just keep keep your questions coming and we'll make sure that you get them answered. Okay, Amanda uh, sort of has a really interesting question. This is good. Okay. Um, they eat very healthy. They're vegan, gluten-free, really watch their uh, oils. Um, but they are sort of, have, she and her husband are having a little struggle over how to go out and eat when you can't control the bad oils. Ah, how do you, so okay, Amanda wants to know how to go out and eat when you can't control the bad oils. Oh, yeah. I, okay, so for starters, I feel your pain. And um, I will tell you that Sequoia and I eat in a lot more the more we study this stuff. And the bad oils are imperative. You'll see on my immune strategy tomorrow, that's one of them is like the right oil, but there's also a, a little caveat to the quantity. So when you go to a restaurant, I think it's um, important to realize that you can ask for a different oil. So a lot of times I will ask like, what oil is in the salad dressing? What oil are you cooking it in? And sometimes the easiest substitution is just butter. Butter would be better, even pasteurized butter would be better than canola oil. So I just did an interview with a woman who has a TED talk called uh, how to get everything you want. It was such a fascinating interview. You go check out her, her TED talk. And she said when she goes to a restaurant, 
what she does is she just sees a bunch of ingredients. She doesn't necessarily see that she has to pick the different uh, recipes that are there. I've never thought of that. And so she's like, when I see the different ingredients, then I know I can make substitutions. So I think you've got to ask and, and see if they can make a substitution of butter um, and, and just ask what oil they're cooking with. I've, I mean, if you put me at a dinner table with a bunch of my holistic docs that we all hang out together, that is, oh my God, that poor waiter, waitress has to go through us all asking different questions, but we're so happy and we, we're, we are, you know, tip well when they when they give us great service and so um yeah so just don't be afraid to ask and then you'll learn over time which restaurants are the best okay. so and oils matter They're really important so thank you for caring about that okay we've had a few questions now i saw a few different ones okay about fruit and keto fruit and keto now keto biotic yeah yeah okay great i love it we're getting some some different questions okay so fruit and keto so I've del I, I'm just pouring from my heart. This is not my head. This is my heart at this moment. I've struggled with where does fruit fit in for me because I love fruit. And yet, how do you keep in keto when you don't have, when you want to have fruit? So the first thing to ask yourself is, are you trying to stay in ketosis? If you're trying to stay into, into ketosis, remember that there's two ways to get into ketos ketosis. You can fast and you can manipulate your macros. So when summer comes and I have more fruit, like my favorite food actually on the whole planet is a white nectarine. So if I wanna eat a bunch of white nectarines, I'm either gonna put that on a feast day, this is why I like the 511, because when I, on, on one day a week, I feast. So I'll either put it there, or what I'll do is maybe on a day where I'm just having one meal a day, I'm in ketosis the majority of the day, and then I'll have fruit at night for my dinner. Now, if you're trying to lose weight, it really has to do with what you're trying to do with your health, but if you're trying to lose weight, um, you could stay to the lower glycemic fruits. And those typically are the berries and something like a green apple. The minute you go into tropical fruits, you're really now spiking your blood sugar up. The only time I recommend somebody go into that is if we're trying to raise progesterone. So the, the, the type of fruit matters. And I, having said all of that, I will tell you since I've been doing keto for the last five plus years, I don't, I don't eat as much fruit as I used to eat. But I also don't want to miss out on some of the amazing things that nature has provided for you. So. Okay, well, I'm just going to ask this one again because uh, it, it keeps like coming talk. up. It comes up every time, and I think it is, is important to repeat. Um, fasting when you're breast. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I now, knew. This is uh, the same woman uh, okay. that asked uh, Amanda that just asked that question. Okay. Uh, her child is already at 15 months. So is there a place? Ah. Uh, oh. Nuance? Okay. So a little so, nuance yeah, on little that. Nuance. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me just, for the record, say when you're pregnant, don't fast. Okay, so just let's just end that discussion right there. When you're nursing, remember that if you're going 17 hours, you've stimulated autophagy. Okay, so remember when you stimulate autophagy, what happens is that moment the intelligence may say, this is not a good cell, and it may kill that cell, and in that killing of the cell, you'll get a redistribution of toxins. That's what we want to avoid if you're nursing, because that what's going to end up happening is those toxins will go to places of fat. So where they go is to the brain and the breasts are full of fat. So now you're nursing and those toxins go into your child. So intermittent fasting would not be the end of the world. I would try not to go over 17 hours. You do not want to stimulate autophagy when you're nursing. So that would be the one thing I would say. Now, there are other things that are so important when you're pregnant and nursing that you don't lose sight of, which is you're passing your microbiome down to your child. They've done some really cool studies. This one fascinates me. Twins that have you know, different microbiome 
and they can see that there's a different, and, and, and a, a mom will nurse one twin from one breast and the other twin from the other breast, and milk production will be different, the bacterial pr uh, production is different, they've measured, they've, the color of the milk is different, because the intelligence of the body is so amazing that, that the, your body is deciding what needs to go into the baby and making, it, making decisions around that. So, so focus on your, on your microbiome, focus on the sauerkrauts, the polyphenol foods, the, the prebiotic foods. Um, what you put on your skin matters when you have skin to skin contact with your child, that you're passing microbiomes down all the time. And when you have an 18 month old, zero to three is when you are really going to build up their, their microbiome. So focus on that, don't go more than 15 hours. Okay, and I think this is sort of a last question. Bill, if you got the last question in, and it looks like we might take him as the last question. Okay. Um, you keep at when he's ending his fast, he keeps having sugar cravings. Ah, uh, okay, this is a good one. Bill is asking about uh, sugar cravings when he ends his fast. So something I encourage you all to do, and I've said this on other videos, but you may have missed them, um, is whenever you're fasting, look at your tongue. So the color of your tongue will ha tell you how much, it's a, like a, an entry into understanding how much candida you might have in your body. So when we fast, especially if we're doing water fasting, at that 24 hour mark, you reboot your intestinal stem cells. Those intestinal stem cells will, will make your gut an, a, a, an inhospitable place for bacteria, and, and things like SIBO and candida to live, and there will be a die-off. So if your tongue is white, if your tongue is yellow, I've seen people's tongues black, then you're getting a die-off of candida. When you go to reintroduce uh, food, the little bit of candida that's there is like, oh my God, feed me, feed me. And so it's, it, this is another like trippy little moment that, that, that I, I geek out on, which is these bacteria in our gut are d controlling our taste buds. So then you think it's because you're not disciplined, but it's not that you're not disciplined, it's that there's back a bacterial need in the gut that is telling you what to taste. So what you can do is start in between your fast, do more candida killing. We have a good protocol on our on drmindypels.com, so you can go to our webpage and just type in Candida into the um, search engine or the search bar, and it'll show you there's a 60-day protocol there. You can do a gut zoomer, which is a test that we uh, do on our patients. You can get that off my website, and we'll, you can test and see if you have Candida. But no doubt, if you are coming out of a fast and you have sugar cravings, there's, there's a candida issue that needs to be addressed. Oh, so. someone's saying it's not on the website anymore. One of our oh. team members. Oh. I don't know. Huh. Go figure. Not the candida protocol. Okay. Well, let me think about how we're going to get you guys the candida protocol. Hmm. Okay. Uh, mm. I don't know the answer to that right now. Um, I don't know. Uh, so, hmm. Anyway. Okay. Move forward. <laughs> sorry. That, that was new info for us. So, yeah, uh, sorry. Um, okay, I think that was last. We're almost at the half an hour, and we need to get you to your next okay. meeting, um, next call that you have. Okay. With your academy. Uh, last thoughts on this fast training week? Yeah, no. So once a month, if you're new to my website, um, please join us. We love doing this as a community. We love doing this worldwide. I'm really excited. My like pet project right now is my Resetter podcast. Um, it just hit, we just found out from Chartable yesterday that it hit the top 200 podcasts uh, in, in the category of health and fitness and science in the world. It was really cool. So um, go listen to it. I've got some great interviews and I've got some really good ones that are coming up. Uh, so go listen to it. Give me feedback. Leave a review if you feel moved. And otherwise, we'll, do, we'll post um, when we're doing the next Fast Training Week. We have them scheduled out. So we'll post in the community page tomorrow. So you guys are awesome. Stay tuned for the immune strategy building uh, video that will come out tomorrow. And as always, never give up on yourself. You are a miracle. And just keep pushing forward because your body wants to heal. Have an awesome day.